Shalom and welcome to Zola Levitt Presents. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we have a great new program this week, don't we? It's a remix yes. of Zola's, one of his classics yes. is Hanukkah. Yes. And you know, Jesus kept this festival. He did. Yeah. In John 10, 22, we find Jesus in the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, in Solomon's porch in the winter. And so it not only was a beautiful picture of Jesus as one who kept the feast, and the, this is an extra biblical feast, it's between the Testaments, but he kept this one, and it's real, a real picture for us of the revelation that we can get out of keeping this, because right. he is the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And so this mm -hmm. is a festival that is about the light of the world. It's a pre festival of the preservation of the Jewish line throughout history in order that Jesus could come. It's full of revelation about God's covenant-keeping power. So let's go right away to Zola on the Mount of Olives. Well, here we are at the center of the earth. Behind me, the Temple Mount of Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and uh, behind it, the old city of Jerusalem and behind that, the western side, the new city. Uh, this, is, this is the place of uh, the future temples. It was the platform on which stood Solomon's and Herod's temple the old temples, and uh, that brings a great deal of history to this place. The history we're interested in for our purposes to look at Hanukkah took place in the 160s BC when a Greco-Syrian commander, Antiochus Epiphanes, went into the Temple Mount and uh, on purpose uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar. He uh, had another one of those final solutions to the Jewish problem, and uh, so he uh, uh, offended the chosen people in this way, desecrated the temple, uh, raided the place and occupied it, truth be told. And the Jews had a revolt against him. Uh, the Maccabee family, Maccabee means hammer, uh, they led a revolt and threw him out. But when they recovered the temple, they had a real problem. It seemed that by the candlestick, there was just a one day's oil. Uh, they. Uh, uh, they had to have it lit all the time. The law is very clear. In Exodus 27:20, uh, uh, God says this about the tabernacle, the forerunner of the temple, and thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. So it took a special procedure. They, they beat olive trees with sticks for the olives to come down. They uh, leave the olive oil that they finally press uh, for a period of time while all the settle, sediment falls to the bottom and it's clear like water. And that is the only way you can use the oil consecrated properly uh, for the lamp. But what were they to do? Uh, there was just one day supply of that and to start beating trees and <laughs> letting oil uh, sit and so forth uh, would, would take seven more days. But the miracle was that that one day's oil lasted the entire time. They, they lit it, there was nothing else to do but pour it into the, the candelabra and, and uh, then it would uh, uh, burn up in, up in a day, they thought, but they prayed over it and so on, and it did last. It burned on and on. It burned eight days, and the new oil was ready. Then they filled the lamp, and it never did go out. Yeah, the miracle is uh, reminiscent of, uh, say, the widow with the oil and the bit of flour that uh, uh, Elijah came and, and caused to last on and on and on and fed the three of them. Uh, that was only one meal's worth. She said she was going to prepare it for her and her son, and then they were simply going to sit down and die. There was there was terrible famine. They had nothing else. And then uh, the loaves and the fishes of, of Jesus were one little boy's lunch. Uh, uh, five loaves and two fishes. Uh, uh, we eat those at breakfast here, small loaves and, and two bits of fish. And uh, he <laughs> took out of that basket enough to feed the 5,000 people. And there were baskets, 12 baskets of leftovers. Uh, God can make things last on earth as he chooses. And this was another instance of that, that oil. And it caused the creation of a new menorah. Now, a menorah is a candlestick. This is one. Uh, this is a Hanukkah menorah. This one back here is the original temple menorah, that is the one in the tabernacle. It has seven branches, as you can see, a middle one here and these others around it. One uh, lights those with the middle candle. In the menorah, uh, there is a center candle with four on either side. 
it looks like nine, it's really eight, but this one is called the Shamish candle. It, you light all the others with this one. The first night, you light the first. The second night, the first and second. The third night, the first three, and so forth. Obviously, this is the Messiah. How the Jews could miss it is a mystery. Uh, of course, he's the one. His, his flame ignites all the other believers in turn, and uh, that, that becomes a type of the Messiah, a real symbol of him. There's a jar to fill uh, <coughs> the, uh, the old candlestick with oil at the bottom. Uh, the new menorah, of course, has uh, candles in it, or it's represented by a beautiful uh, modern Israeli creation based on the old oil lamps, and there's the jar, the shamash, the servant. Uh, also, there's a dreidel. This is a little top. You can see there are letters on it. The letters are uh, Nun Gimel Hey Pei. They make a, uh, uh, an acronym uh, that says a great miracle occurred here. When I was a little kid, uh, we played with these dreidels. These games you play to spin the top, and it lands on a certain letter. Uh, we sang a song. It went, uh, dreidel, 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 I made it out of clay, da 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 and so on. Uh, this is a happy holiday, a triumphant holiday, and no wonder. When the Messiah returns, uh, this is the holiday on which he's going to evidently rebuild the uh, uh, millennial temple and start the kingdom, the Feast of Dedication. Daniel 8 gives the whole story of the history of uh, Antiochus. It tells the story of uh, the, the empire being divided in four parts, and one of them, the Little Horn, uh, which is Antiochus, comes and raids the beautiful place, the temple site, and so on. And in figure, he gives the story. It's really a prediction since Daniel lived centuries before that miracle, and it's a prophecy, and it was fulfilled uh, by Antiochus. By the way, Daniel digresses while talking about this uh, story of the little horn uh, to talk about the Antichrist of the end times. Daniel 8.25, uh, by peace shall he destroy many, Daniel says. And it's a hint that the Antichrist is perhaps Greco-Syrian in background. He comes out of a Rome, but he perhaps has that background because it's as if Daniel said, while I'm talking about this Greco-Syrian tyrant, let me also speak of the dark prince who is to come. Uh, a very uh, uh, telling passage in uh, Daniel's end times prophecy. Now, Jesus also celebrated this uh, festival. It was a national festival, not listed in Leviticus 23 with Passover and unleavened bread and so on, but it's uh, uh, listed... Uh, uh, in prophecy in Daniel 8, and then the Lord commemorated it himself. Uh, John 10, 22 says this, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, which is Hanukkah, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Yes, it's in December, and uh, uh, this is, uh, Jesus came all this way. You know, it was a, a five-day journey sleeping under the stars to come here from Capernaum in Galilee, and yet he came for this festival. So that gives it credence. And then in Daniel 12, there's a complex series of numbers, 1290 days, 1335 days. If you get our book on the seven feasts, you'll see the calculation that shows that these numbers uh, add up to the fact that the Lord will probably dedicate the new temple, the millennial temple on Hanukkah in the kingdom to come. It is the 25th day of Kislev. It occurs at exactly the right time after the second coming. And so in that millennial temple where uh, we will worship with the Lord, uh, that too will be established on a feast of dedication. The Bible Lands. You've read about them. Now encounter them for yourself. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus at the Jordan, Galilee, Jerusalem. Journey in the shadow of Paul to Athens, Corinth, Ephesus. Join Miles and Catherine Weiss on a tour of the Bible Lands and witness the Word come to life as never before. Call 1-800-WONDERS. The Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights, and it's also Hanukkah. Yeah. We have an amazing resource that we want to offer you. It's a three-part series. 
Uh, Jeff and Sandra are on this teaching. Mm -hmm. But most of all, the Jewish people commemorate yes. God's victory over evil man. He right? Does. They light the candles yep. and they retell the story from mm -hmm. generation to generation, their exactly. children, that God is a God who, who comes through for yeah, us. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does. And, you know, the shamash candle, I love hearing that story and the understanding of the servant who comes and lights the rest of the candles. And mm. really, that's the story of the light of the world right. is going to come. In fact, it looks forward to this incredible story that, that Jesus comes as the overcoming Messiah. And it's because God says who he is and he means it. In Psalm 121, Verse 4, he says, He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And that's true today. Even as we see the nations surrounding facing. Israel, we see the nations surrounding and, and threatening, mm -hmm. God promises that he will keep Israel. Listen to this, that, that it didn't help Haman, Herod, Hitler, and it won't help Hamas, because all of those are expressions of Hasatan, the adversary, Satan. And he cannot put out the light that's because right. the light overcomes the darkness That's and right. the light of Messiah is shining today and will keep shining until the return of the Lord. Hashem. Hashem. It will, he will just keep shining until the return of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of the mm -hmm. Jews and the Savior of the world. Now the story continues with Joseph and Mary mm -hmm. in Bethlehem. They come up to Bethlehem for the census because they're of the house of David, they are of the tribe of Judah, and there are specific reasons why it had to be so. So now let's go to a drama to tell a little bit about Joseph and Mary at the birth of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Listen to the word of the Lord. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Miriam, with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Mm. What a story. The greatest story ever told and it's because the shamash candle of Hanukkah is now coming into the world, born of a woman, born of this earth, in order to identify with us. And he left heaven, according to Philippians 2, verses 5 and following. He left his first estate. He left what was rightful for him and came here on our behalf. And it is the story of the Jewish Messiah. It's so amazing to me. Christmas is a Jewish story. I didn't know. My rabbi didn't tell me. I wish he had told me, but he didn't. And one of the things that happens to Jewish people when we come into the faith is we realize that this story is about these over 300 prophecies of mm. the Messiah being fulfilled by this one person. And there's no other way and no other person who could have or did fulfill this other than Yeshua HaMashiach. And that's his name, Yeshua. He's Hebrew. He's born in Bethlehem. He grows up in Nazareth, but when they come up to Bethlehem for the census before the birth, it's because God designed Bethlehem to be the place of the birth. Mm. 
Beit Lechem, the house of bread. The bread of heaven comes to earth, is born of man, goes to the cross, goes into the ground, comes out of the ground, goes back to heaven, and is preparing a place for you and me. An amazing, incredible story, an awesome story. That's why uh, we celebrate this holiday. And it's a victory over death. Yes. It's a victory for the Jewish people to yes. remember, yes. you know, Hanukkah and yeah. then the, the birth of Jesus, yes. to remember that God, He's the victor. Exactly. He's the victor. Um, also, Miles, tell a little bit about how how oil is made. You know, it's such a process from the olive oil tree, and it's almost like the Lord, you know, being crushed and, and beaten and um, everything that He went through so that that light could continue to yeah. shine. Yeah, the very process of making the fine oil, the anointing oil, the temple oil, is the crushing and beating and pressing mm -hmm. that was part of Jesus' sacrifice for you and me. And speaking of this birth, why Bethlehem? Because Micah 5.2 tells us, O thou Bethlehem, though thou be smallest among the cities of Judah, yeah. yet out of you will come he whose goings forth have been from everlasting to everlasting, a messianic prophecy. And so he fulfills that by being born in Bethlehem as the bread of life. And Joseph and Mary come up to Bethlehem to be taxed there. Now, when they came into town, uh, it was a very small place. There were about 400 families mm -hmm. there, very small area. They came from Nazareth to a smaller place in Bethlehem. And if he had been born in Jerusalem, it would have been one of many, many births, would have been unnoticed. But in Bethlehem, this was a big deal. So they're on their way into town, mm. and she's about to deliver. The shepherds in the outskirts of town, they know that there's no room at the inn, so to speak. They know that there is no place, no mm. hotels are available. There's no place for them to have this baby. They can see she's about to be delivered. And so they offer her a place in the outskirts of town, near the fields. Now, we've been to those fields. Right. When we taught Not about Not very Ruth, comfortable. No. We taught about <laughs> Ruth and Boaz. And that's a fascinating part of the story, too. Because God, in His sovereignty, knit Ruth, a Moabitess, into the lineage of Jesus so that there could be no prejudice about Jew and Gentile. There would always be an understanding that the lineage of David Therefore, the lineage of Jesus included the Gentiles, not only the Gentiles, but the Moabites who were accursed of God, but yet God overrode that by His grace mm -hmm. and brought Ruth in to the lineage of Jesus so mm -hmm. that his, his forebear was Ruth the Moabitess. Mm -hmm. I love that part of the story. Mm -hmm. And when we teach Ruth and Boaz, and you may have seen us teach that, it's really about Jew and Gentile coming together. Your people shall be my people. And where she had her child was not a little, you know, manger made of wood or, you know, this right. sterile environment. I mean, it was really with the animals. So right. the Lord himself would say to us, yeah. he knows exactly, he's been, he's been everywhere. Exactly. He's been able to fellowship with our sufferings. Exactly. He identifies with the lowly things oh, of the well, earth, even though you. he's the king of heaven. Right. He identifies with the lowly things of the earth. In fact, if you've come to come with us to Israel, you know that there are very few wooden buildings. There's no trees. There are olive trees, right. and there are trees that are used for other purposes. Olive trees for food, for oil, for light, and for teaching. But there's not any lumber for building buildings. Everything's made of stone. So the likelihood is that this was not some hallmark card exactly. picture of a barn out in the western Pennsylvania somewhere. This was probably a cave Mm -hmm. or some very, very rough stone structure where the animals were kept. It was not pretty, it was not sterile, it was pretty rough. And there's purpose in that as well because he identifies with the early yeah. lowly things of the and world. And yet God brought kings to honor his birth. Exactly. The Magi come to worship, they come to, to, to say yes to the king. And that's why the story of Herod trying to get rid of all the children under two years old is so fascinating and is a repeat of the story that happened to Moses, who's a type of the Lord, because God, God's always trying to and always will bring forth His purposes, but there's always opposition. Mm -hmm. And there's opposition to so Jesus we can't, as well. So we can't faint or fall, fall uh, afraid when opposition happens, no, but we, we face it with, with faith in the Lord. Exactly. And that's you know, one of the tie-ins also to the, to the Hanukkah and the eight candles, the new beginnings. The number eight is new beginnings. There's eight 
candles that are lit and it's a picture for us of the new beginning that God wants to bring, a rededication of self to the purposes of God, mm -hmm. just as the coming of Messiah is a new beginning for the whole earth. It's an opportunity for the entire world to turn to the King of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's what the birth of Jesus is about. In John 8, 12, Jesus says that He is the light of the world. Right. In John 1, 4, we hear that the light of life comes to light man. And Matthew 5, 14 speaks because of that light, because of the light coming, because of Him being the light of the world, we are to bring this light to those around us. That's why I love doing these programs, because we get an opportunity to bring the light of life to the world at large. And this program brings the connection yes. between the Jewish heritage yes. and, and, the, and the living branches that we are as Gentiles grafted into the root. Exactly. That's why when we, in our home congregation, we call this message Hanukkah, Christmas, and you, because it really does connect the seamlessness of Hanukkah and God, pres His preserving power in order to bring Christmas, the birth of Jesus, and because of that, salvation for you and for me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, why December 25th? We don't really know when Jesus was born. There's controversy. Uh, Zola believed it might have been in spring, but he openly said, maybe not. We're not sure. Some people believe Jesus was conceived as the light of the world at Hanukkah and born at Tabernacles as God with us, Emmanuel. Uh, he might have been born at the spring when the shepherds are out in their fields. It's very possible that it was a springtime. But he gives us dates, and they're very concurrent in his word. Well, you know, when it comes to the feasts of the Lord, the dates are known. When it comes to extra-biblical information, like when the birth was, we can't be exactly right. sure. But why did they pick December 25th? It probably relates to Kislev 25, which is the winter holiday season. And so they probably took that date and made it the birth of Jesus uh, for convenience. And it really ties it into Saturnalia and the existing festivals that were taking place at the time. But that's not so important. What is important is that he came for you and he came for me. Right. And because of God's covenant-keeping power, he preserves the line of the Jewish people yeah. so that the Jewish Messiah could come to earth so that you could say yes to him. And so today we're hoping that as you hear this message, that you will say, yes, I see that he is the light of the world. And I say yes to you, Yeshua. Come into my life. Come into my heart. I want to receive you as my Messiah, as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Take me into your life. Give me your eternal life so that I can be with you forever.
Our prayer for you is that this season of Hanukkah and Christmas will be a time of real spiritual advance, that you and your family will be blessed yes. because of the presence of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus, our Messiah. We want to offer you this resource, the Feast of Lights. It is a three-part series teaching about Hanukkah and also teaching about the prophetic fulfillment that Hanukkah plays in this end times and points us to the Lord and also shares a little bit about how you can keep Hanukkah in your home. So we want to make that available. Amen. Yeah. Remember, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, the DVD, The Feast of Lights. In this three-part series, Dr. Jeffrey Seif presents an insightful review of Hanukkah, past, present, and future. This holy occasion, observed by our Lord, is a remembrance of the eternal light in the temple and the miracle of the oil that enabled the menorah lamps to continue burning, despite the onslaught of evil forces. This holy day is a reminder that our Lord never slumbers or sleeps in sustaining His chosen people. Ask for the DVD, The Feast of Lights. Also, please call toll-free or write to receive our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. It's absolutely free and contains insightful article and news commentary with a refreshing perspective you won't get from the mainstream media. The Levitt Letter is also available at levitt.com along with current and archived TV programs, our national airing schedule. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.